the waiver wire has been popping early in 2023, but unless you were aggressive with your free agent acquisition budget or were one of the bad teams lucky enough to have a top waiver wire claim, you probably missed out on names like Kyron Williams in week one, Jerome Ford in week two, and Devon Achan in week three. And that's why it pays to be a week ahead of the next big breakout, especially when we've got the underlying signals in the data. And that's exactly what we have heading into week four. We will cover four players with blow up potential that you might still be able to claim even after waivers have processed for your league. So let's get started with rookie wide receiver Josh Downs of the Indianapolis Colts only rostered in 3% of leagues. And we'll begin with that talent profile, a guy that was thought to be a round two pick. He did slide to round three in the NFL draft, but there's a lot to like about his game. First, Downs broke out early. He had a 40% target share as a sophomore. This guy can demand looks. And secondly, we often get concerned about slot receivers coming out of college, not being able to beat man or press man coverage. That wasn't the case at all with Downs. Over his last two seasons, he had the second highest yards per route run against press man coverage against power five opponents. While the round three draft capital does factor into the fantasy life wide receiver rookie supermodel, and it did hurt Downs, he still got a solid score. He came in at the 69th percentile, and we've seen 46% of wide receivers that finish in that range in score go on to post a top 24 finish in their first three seasons. So let's turn our attention to how the Colts are utilizing their rookie wide receiver and using the utilization suite of tools, which you can see for free over at fantasylife.com. You will notice in week three, it was a season high in route participation, targets per route run and target share for downs. And if under the utilization tools, we head over to the team styles button, we can actually see but this is a very different scheme than what we've seen under Frank Reich over the last few years, where they used a lot of multiple tight end personnel groupings. Now, three wide receivers or 11 personnel is the primary grouping that they're using under new head coach Shane Steichen. They've been at 70% or higher in all three weeks, and that is opening up more opportunities for downs. And while we're looking at this team information, let's take a look at the summary drop down and we can see drop back rate over expectation is 1% versus the league average. Now, what this tells us is based on the games that the Colts have been in and we look at it at the play level, how have they behaved versus other NFL teams over the last three seasons? in the same type of scenarios. And so we can see no longer are the Colts a run first offense like what we saw under Frank Reich. They are a balanced offense. Again, another factor opening up opportunities for Josh Downs we weren't sure would be there when the season began. So while we're on the topic of team environment for the Colts, let's hit a couple of other quick notes. And the first thing is target competition. There's just not a lot of it for the Colts. Alec Pierce was not a high-end target earner in college. He's also not shown that at the pro level. That gives Downs a very good opportunity to become the number two in this offense. And then finally, Gardner Minshew. Yes, he was in the game when we saw the biggest target share of the season for Downs, but guess what? Good wide receivers get targeted regardless of who the quarterback is under center. We do get occasional exceptions to this rule, but for the most part, if a wide receiver is good, they will be targeted by whichever quarterback is under center, which is why I throw most quarterback wide receiver splits into the trash can. So to quickly put a bow on downs, we've got a player with a solid talent profile and a bigger role than we expected with this Colts offense evolving, and he's available in almost all leagues. He's a great preemptive pickup, and mid-size to larger formats, I would much rather have Downs on my roster right now than names like Rashad Bateman and Juju Smith-Schuster, who are rostered far more often. So let's dive into our second name, and that is Zach Charbonnet, running back for the Seattle Seahawks. Now, I see some of you smirking at me. Yes, if you play in a larger league, you're not getting Charbonnet, but he's available right now 
in almost half of leagues if you go over and you look at Yahoo. So with that said, he's a guy that we really need to discuss. And if for some reason he is gone in your league, he's also a buy low candidate. With Charbonnet, we will start with Talon, as we always do. This is a guy that graded out as my number three running back prospect in this class. A former four-star recruit, he is a very well-rounded player. He can get out there on passing downs. He can score from inside the five-yard line. He has a lot of outs. Despite that well-rounded profile, I have heard some analysts question the dynamic playmaking ability of Charbonnet. And when I dug into the data, I didn't really see a concern. Honestly, it looked like it was a potential strength. 69th percentile and explosive rush rate. So carries of 10 plus yards or more. He did that 17% of the time. And then if we look at his missed tackles force per attempt, he came in at 23%. That's in the 73rd percentile. So if we take a look at how Charbonnet fared in the Fantasy Life Rookie Supermodel, he came in at the 80th percentile, third back in the class behind B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs. But if we look at guys in that group, 32% of them went on to post a top six finish in their first three seasons in the NFL, and 63% went on to post a top 24 finish in their first three years. So clearly Charbonnet has that talent profile as a round two NFL draft pick that we're looking for, but what about the utilization? Well, over the first couple of weeks, he didn't have much of a role at all, but things changed in week three. He saw a season high in snaps, rushing attempts, route participation, and targets per route run. If Charbonnet can manage to stay in that 40% range for snaps, 25 to 30% of the rushing attempts, 40, 45% route participation, and he gets a decent targets per route run. He's going to move into the running back three conversation as soon as next week. For now, I've moved him to RB4 with upside status. So let's talk a little bit about that team environment. And first of all, Kenneth Walker looks great. He is not going anywhere, so we shouldn't expect Charbonnet to suddenly overtake him for the lead job. But this is a quality offense for the Seattle Seahawks. They're converting 25% of their drives into touchdowns. That's eighth best in the NFL. We could argue that there is upside because they're not even playing with their two starting tackles right now. This is an offense that we want pieces of. So let's tidy up here with Zach Charbonnet. We've got a talented profile. We've got an expanding role on an offense that we like. That means if he's available on your waiver wire, he should be on your team over names like Antonio Gibson, Kareem Hunt, Gus Edwards. I would even do it over Samaj P. Ryan. Those names are all rostered more than Zach Charbonnet right now. If he's not available, it's a great buy low opportunity. He could have standalone running back three value as soon as this next data point comes in in week four. And if something does happen to Kenneth Walker, we have a potential running back one. All right, now let's move to our honorable mentions. It's the final two names. And just because they're in this section doesn't mean you should pay any less attention to them. These are two guys I'm going to be very aggressive about adding to my rosters wherever I can. So our first name here is Marvin Mims, rookie wide receiver for the Denver Broncos, only rostered in 27% of leagues. That is almost as bad as his route participation, which is at 28% on the season. What are we doing, Broncos? A guy named Brandon Johnson with a 13% targets per route run is playing in front of Marvin Mims right now. The Broncos are not good on offense. Marvin Mims does the things Russell Wilson loves. All the things we saw from Mims in college that made him a smash in the wide receiver rookie supermodel. He graded out as good as a first round pick in our model. He leads the team with a 33% targets per route run. This is not a matter of if. This really feels like it's gotta be more of when. The Broncos have to get Marvin Mims on the field more. And once that happens, he might be the best wide receiver on the team. I would immediately move him to wide receiver three with wide receiver two upside. And we might even get more than that. So go get it. You know, we have to get a tight end into the conversation here. And it's none other than Jake 
Ferguson, the second-year player for the Dallas Cowboys, only rostered in 41% of leagues, and oh my goodness, a 27% targets per route run of tight ends to be on the field for at least 40% of their team's passes. That's number two in the NFL. Yet the Cowboys somehow are only playing this guy roughly half the time. They've got a three-way rotation going on. And guess what? Even though that's happening, this guy has moved up to a high-end tight end two in my rankings. And if he somehow starts to get on the field, 70, 75, 80%, we're going to have another Sam Laporta on our hands. I would much rather have Ferguson on my roster at this point than Tyler Higby, Cole Komet, Chig Okonkwo, he has passed all of those guys and he has legit top six upside with more playing time. That makes him someone that we want to target. 